Hi. Uh, we're going to talk about the von Neumann architecture and uh, its impact on, on the operating systems and computers in general. Uh, all computers today, whether it's a server up in the Amazon cloud, whether it's a server run locally, or even something as simple as your phone are based upon this architecture. Uh, the von Neumann architecture was introduced in the mid 20th century. Uh, the first such computer was the ENIAC. Uh, and so let's, let's learn a little more about this fundamental aspect of computing. It's a very simple architecture where we have a compute engine or a CPU, so a central processor unit, which executes instructions on data. We also have a set of memory or RAM. Between the CPU and the memory is a bus. And instructions and data both move across the bus to the CPU. The only thing the CPU can see is data that's in your memory itself or instructions that are in your memory itself. The fundamental difference between the von Neumann architecture and our architectures before that is within the memory itself, which is volatile, you have both data and instructions. At the time, this was revolutionary. Before this, the instructions were outside the computer. If you looked at the earlier versions of, let's say, Colossus uh, by Turing, uh, the program was outside the computer itself and controlled the computer while the data was kept in the memory itself. Now, because the CPU can only see the memory, we need to be able to get data in and out of the memory itself. And so to do that, we have devices on the outside. These devices can be things like a disk, a network, your keypad. And in order for the devices to get to the memory or the CPU, they interrupt the execution of the CPU itself. Let's say your disk finishes and wants to move some data into the memory. The CPU will receive an interrupt, it will go to an interrupt handler, and it will start running the instructions of that interrupt in the CPU itself. Other, also, if you're running in the CPU and you need to go to a device, you can make a call down through a system call, generally. There's a slight optimization. As data moves from your disk or your network through your CPU, you can see that this path can be slow. CPUs are relatively fast compared to memory. Devices are extremely slow. Oftentimes, when a device needs to move a block of memory from either the disk or the network into memory, it will pin into memory a chunk of space and directly write from the device into the memory itself. This is called direct memory access. Uh, von Neumann was uh, an interesting character and he's worth learning more about. He was a monumental figure in mathematics, uh, economics, uh, and computers in the mid-20th century, right around World War II. He worked uh, on a number of key theories, including the Monte Carlo method. He's the founder of game theory. Uh, he also was a key contributor to the atomic bomb and the Manhattan Project. He worked directly with Man uh, Oppenheimer and was there with the first detonation of the atomic bomb. Post this, he worked on a theory called mutually assured destruction, which basically says as long as there's tons of nuclear weapons available, nobody would be crazy enough to uh, set them off. Hopefully he's right. Uh, after that, merge sort. You've probably learned merge sort in one of your algorithms classes. He did that. Now, the architecture is called the von Neumann architecture, but funny enough, he didn't come up with it. A guy named Presper Eckert came up with it when the ENIAC was being created. The ENIAC was created by generally two people, Presper as well as John Mochley. Von Neumann worked closely with those two on the ENIAC and wrote up the architecture. And since um, he wrote the first papers describing the architecture, he's often credited with the architecture itself. Was Presper Eckhart upset about this? Yes. Uh, let's look at the architecture in a little more detail. There is one fundamental problem, often called the von Neumann bottleneck. And that is the bus. Both the data and the instructions have to go over this bus. 
The bus runs at a much slower clock speed than the CPU and sometimes the memory itself. And so all computers are bound by this von Neumann bottleneck. There's been many architectural uh, updates to try to address the von Neumann bottleneck. The most uh, uh, powerful one is the cache. And so the idea of the cache is to have some memory which sits very close to the CPU, possibly one or two cycles away, as opposed to the real memory out here, which is sometimes 20 or 30 cycles away. When you access a variable, x equals 7, it may be sitting out in physical memory, but it moves across the bus and it ends up also in your cache. The cache is so um, important for the architecture that most CPUs have multiple levels of cache. You'll find that there is an instruction cache, an L1 cache, which is usually on the same silicon of the, as the chip itself, an L2 cache, and a level 3 cache. As you move out, the caches get bigger, but they're further cycles away from the um, CPU itself. The cache is mainly there to avoid the bottleneck on the bus itself. That's an overview of both the von Neumann architecture and the von Neumann bottleneck. One other point I'd like to talk about, and that's the CPU executing code. We've talked about code running or instructions sitting in memory and being carried over to the CPU. The CPU runs in basically in two different modes. In the first mode, it's running user code. So your x equals 7 in your C++ application. However, let's say you want to do something to a device. Let's say I want to do a write or maybe a fork. So I want to do something that only the kernel can do. What happens is a system call is made and the code traps into the kernel. The trap is a physical change in the CPU and moves to a higher, higher privileged mode. And so the CPU runs in user space. Let me draw it like this. Running in user space, your code, you make a system call like write or fork. It drops down into a higher privileged kernel mode. This is a trap. On the CPU itself, there's a bit. Usually it's uh, one or two bits, so there could be you know, between two to four different modes. But there's a bit that gets set that I am now executing highly privileged code, and I can do things like talk to devices, look at all of memory, even memory that's outside of my process itself. When the system call returns, you come back out of kernel mode, back into user mode itself. The system call is one way to drop into kernel code. There's one other way to get to kernel code, and that's through the interrupt. Let's say I'm running some user code, and a uh, device finishes what it needs to do. Or maybe you get interrupted from the network. Maybe a packet comes in over TCP IP and it has some data for you. The interrupt will come into the CPU. The CPU has a table of interrupt handlers. The correct interrupt handler starts running. That's, in, that's a kernel mode in, um, that's kernel code in kernel mode. So two mechanisms to get into the uh, kernel through a system call and through an interrupt. Thank you very much.